Hello, everybody. It's really great to be here. Um, I direct a group at MIT that works on technology for mapping and repairing the brain. Um, and this is, uh, lecture has been a great opportunity to reflect sort of on the implications of what we've been observing as we try to pioneer inventions in an arena where there is no textbook. There are no um, instructions on what to do. Um, and uh, one of the things I want to do today is take a step back and say, well, first of all, what have we learned through our journey? And secondly, how general are these insights? And thirdly, can we convert them into um, learnable, teachable things? You know, are these skills that can be uh, applied? Can you actually make yourself, if you will, lucky? And I would argue that you know, brain technology is a very new arena. And we've learned a lot by incubating it and growing it in the last 12 years or so. Um, and we've learned a lot. You know, we've learned that we can think backwards from complex problems. We can try to systematically think of solutions in comprehensive ways. And we can really try to tap into um, natural um, structures of intellectual problem in order to look for patterns. Um, so my hope is that you know, we'll, we'll range in today's talk uh, from topics relating to cancer, to Alzheimer's, to philosophy, to new methods of 3D printing, if we get to it. Um, and so let's see where we end up. Yeah, so the theme that I wanted to kick off with was this idea that in the 20th century, we saw a lot of advances in the sciences that both were fundamental in a sense. Think of rockets to land on the moon, or airplanes, or transistors, or lasers, or computers and the internet that also had a lot of very practical implications for everyday life. Um, the inventions of the 20th century um, really stand out maybe in the history of humanity in terms of their ability to empower people and to allow people to create um, and to understand their world and also to travel quickly and to uh, generate value. And I think if you look at the problems that a lot of us are wrestling with right now, about a sixth of the way into the 21st century, whether it's changes in climate, or brain diseases, or cancers, um, or challenges in education, or in poverty. Um, these seem like hard problems. Um, the failure rate is very high. The cost of potential solutions is enormous. In my own field of brain technology, the cost to take a brain drug out of the lab and into the marketplace is huge. Maybe a billion or two dollars. The failure rate is over 90% and it takes about a decade. And even then, the treatments often do not work. So there's a lot of worry that um, scientific progress is slowing. And there's a lot of worry that the problems that remain to us are very challenging. And so it's fun to take a step back and ask, well, why are these problems so hard? Well, one possibility is that when you're in the thick of things, progress looks slow. Uh, it's easy to forget now that it took decades from, for the airplane to, to take off, so to speak. Uh, between the Wright brothers and eventually commercial aviation, like the plane that got me here late last night. Um, from the transistor to the microchip was 12 years, and from the microchip to the personal computer was another 16 years, and then from the personal computer to the internet was another 14 years. And so maybe things look tough when you're in the middle of it. But I think that actually another possibility is that the problems that we are dealing with are actually harder in some ways. If you look at the 20th century, a lot of these discoveries and innovations relate to physics. The moon landing, the transistor, the microchip. There's a fairly small number of things that you have to think about in physics and a fairly small number of ways that those things interact. Electrons and protons, um, you know, molecular bonds and all sorts of things like that. But if you think about education or biology or medicine or the kinds of topics that we were talking about on the previous slide, there are lots of building blocks. The human genome contains, what, 30,000 genes, and who knows how many combinations of interactions there are. In economics, or in politics, or in education, there's so many variables. And these variables are hard to see, and they're hard to quantify, and they're hard to control. So I think what often happens when we deal with brain diseases, or cancer, or energy, is um, we often try to make simplifying assumptions in our attempt to understand these problems. But assuming the problem is simple doesn't actually make it simple. And so I think the problem is that um, you know, we end up making assumptions, and late in the game, a lot of the solutions can fall apart. So in my group at MIT, you, using technology of the brain as a test bed, we've been really thinking about what can we learn? What can we solve? And are there generalized insights that we can make that allow us to 
uh, maybe solve problems in other fields as well? Can we de-risk our problem in a way that increases our luck? Can we, as the title of the talk uh, speaks towards, engineer serendipity? Now another point of view, and it's a very popular one right now, is to think about the concept of the moonshot thing. Let's just go for it. Pour lots of money and talent and time into it. Fail fast. Plunge on. Plunge on. And so it's useful, you know, I'd like to study the history of science to learn about its future. And I went back and actually learned about the moon landing. And it's interesting, if you look at JFK's speech proposing that we go to the moon, he wasn't saying, here's this impossible goal, let's foolishly try to conquer it. He actually argued that it's actually pretty straightforward to get there if we put our hearts and minds to it. He argued within the last 19 months, 45 satellites have circled the Earth. He argued that we are behind and we might be behind if we, uh, for some time. In other words, it's not an impossible goal that we have no chance of getting at. It's actually, if we put our hearts and minds to it, a feasible thing. I don't mean to trivialize it at all. Obviously, one of the, it's one of the great achievements of our time. Uh, but the risk was low because landing on the moon was built on lots of solid science. We knew where the moon was. We know about gravity. We know about rockets. This goes back for centuries of science that builds upon science that builds upon science. And so it was a great feat of engineering. Again, I don't mean to trivialize it in any way, but the science risk, if you will, was fairly low. In 1962, at the time of JFK's speech, physics was a pretty known thing. Now, um, imagine that we tried to land on the moon 400 years ago. Let's say the year 1600 to be, you know, to pick a number. We don't understand gravity very well. We don't have the mathematics to figure out how to launch a rocket. We don't know what aerodynamics. You probably end up with something like this. People start launching hot air balloons. You start tying kites to chairs. Um, in fact, I believe some people tried such things. And maybe all the money on Earth would not get you anywhere near the moon in the year 1600. Now, I think sometimes you see a dichotomy that is not completely true put forth. OK, you can do basic science at a very slow rate forever and ever. We don't want to wait 400 years to solve the brain or come up with better energy or cure cancer. On the other hand, we don't want to be taking shortcuts that end up making assumptions that we later regret. And so I would argue there is a third path. What if we build the tools that accelerate the science? What if we were in the year 1600 to figure out the physics and invent the mathematics rather than tying kites to chairs or hot air balloons trying to get them into outer space? So this third path is a sort of interesting way to think. Can we accelerate the path to understanding? For these 21st century sciences, where there are lots of building blocks and lots of interactions, we can be creative by maybe building tools that let us observe and control those building blocks and those interactions. This requires new technology, which is one of the reasons why it isn't yet a particularly popular way to think, but we're getting there. You know, you see all these multi-billion dollar projects now emerging to try to make maps of the building blocks of the body. I think that's a good sign. The map of the genome, of course, kicked off a lot of modern biology, and we are arguably still in the early stages. But building these tools is hard. The tools for editing the genome, for visualizing molecules, these all were sort of stumbled across. Um, CRISPR, I think a lot of us have heard of that, was discovered by some scientists studying yogurt, of all things. Fluorescent proteins, which let you see the genes that are active in a cell, those were stumbled across by a curious marine biologist who was obsessed with jellyfish. So one way to ask this question is, can we get to the ground truth faster? Can we do on purpose what previous generations did accidentally? One of my favorite stories is about this uh, gentleman named Julius uh, Wagner Joreg, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1927. So remember, the greatest idea of its time. And what did he get it for? Well, he would take patients with dementia paralytica, and he would deliberately give them malaria. Now, this might not seem like a great idea for medical therapy. Remember, it was a Nobel Prize winning discovery. Why is that? Well, at the time, you know, this disease was caused by the parasite that causes syphilis. And malaria causes a high fever, which can kill the parasite. So at the time, this was not a bad way to go, although it did have a 15% chance of killing the patient. So that was not the popular part of this therapy. So that was 1927. <coughs> One year later, 1928, penicillin is found. And to the, nowadays, if you look at dementia that's related to syphilis, it's pretty much unheard of. By going to the ground truth, by figuring out the germ, 
that you, uh, that's causing the diseases and then coming up with antibiotics that selectively destroy the germ, you can actually wipe this out. Fleming, of course, found this accidentally. He had some plates of bacteria and he came back one day to find out that a fungal infection had wiped them out. And famously, he looked at the plates and said, that's funny. So how can we actually start to engineer serendipity? My day job is to work on the brain. And what I hope to do today is to, through some illustrative examples from our group, but also taking a step back and thinking about what general knowledge might emerge, is to see whether indeed we can pick out a couple tricks that are, again, learnable and teachable that allow us to think about how to be creative in the context of these 21st century sciences. So why is the brain so difficult? Well, it's incredibly complex. You know, in a cubic millimeter of your brain, you have 100,000 brain cells connected by a billion connections called synapses. And they operate at a very high speed, around 1,000 times a second. They can go up to the potential to release chemical transmitters or fire off electrical pulses. So in my day job, the goal is to really build tools to achieve these ground truth kinds of insights. You know, can we discover penicillin on purpose rather than accidentally? And to do that, we need to watch these high-speed interactions of these brain cells. We need to control those high-speed interactions. And we need to map out how they're, they're wired up, how are they connected. If we can watch what's happening in the brain, we can see how those patterns go wrong in diseases like epilepsy. If we can control the high-speed dynamics, maybe we can repair the changes that go wrong in brain diseases. And by mapping out how it changes at the molecular level, maybe we can actually understand how molecular changes occur and how we could fix them in conditions like Alzheimer's disease. So one of the things that we do when we try to go for these ground truth insights is first of all to understand the structure of the problem. And again, a lot of these problems have a lot of building blocks and a lot of ways they interact. But in the brain, there are two other problems that really make it stand out in the biomedical sciences. The first is the incredible spatial scales that we deal with. Brain cells are enormous. They're centimeters in spatial extent. Single brain cells can go a meter down our spinal cord. Single cells. And yet, if you care about the wiring, those are nanoscale wires called axons. There are nanoscale connections between brain cells called synapses that we're zooming in in this little cartoon. And at those connections, they're jam-packed with nanoscale molecules. So how on earth can you see these large-scale three-dimensional objects without losing sight of their building blocks. A very difficult challenge. And the other challenge is time. So if you care about memory, if you care about Alzheimer's disease, if you care about learning and development, those are processes that take years, even decades. But the quantal building blocks, the, the most small, fine-scale things that occur in the brain are a millisecond in duration. Millisecond duration electrical pulses within brain cells millisecond duration chemical exchanges between brain cells. So in some ways, our challenge in the brain is that we not only have to deal with all these building blocks, but we have to figure out how they communicate across space and across time. Now, one of the hopes here, of course, is if we can understand how brains compute, this could maybe help us understand something fundamental about the human condition. What does it mean when we think? What does it mean to have a feeling? What makes us different from this computer in front of me right now? But of course, there's a very practical and urgent concern as well, which is brain diseases, which affect a lot of people around the world. And if you look at the list here, uh, pretty much none of these can be cured, um, and the treatments are pretty partial and have a lot of side effects. I mentioned earlier how costly and long duration it takes to make a brain therapy. And on top of all that, they often don't work for everybody. So let's talk about a couple short stories and then take a step back and try to think about what can we learn um, about creativity and thinking that might apply to other arenas as well. Well, this first theme that I want to talk about is getting down to the ground truth, right? Invent penicillin. Don't give people malaria. And so one of the ideas that we decided was, what if we could map every molecule in every cell in a circuit? What if we could get down to the ground truth for the brain? That's a very challenging thing to propose. How are the molecules organized in the cells? How are the cells organized in the networks? I think we've all seen pictures like this, you know, brain scans. They're very, very popular uh, because, of course, they're non-invasive. You can scan somebody's brain without having to um, do anything surgical. But these blobs or voxels that light up, they contain millions and millions of cells. And two cells that are nearby can be doing completely different things. 
And each of these little blobs that's active reflects millions of cells. So at the other extreme, you have microscopes. Microscopes cannot be used on living humans, of course, but they can be very powerful because you can stare at tiny things like cells. But even microscopes aren't powerful enough. They can't see those wires. They can't see the connections. And they sure can't see the molecules. So one of the things we try to do to get down to the ground truth is to um, sometimes think about doing the opposite of what people are doing. For hundreds of years, people have been zooming in on the brain. What if we do the opposite and try to blow the brain up? And so it turns out that a bunch of physicists have been studying polymers, like the stuff you find in baby diapers. These are polymers that absorb huge amounts of water. So in this cartoon, you can see a little sketch of what it might look like if you zoomed way into a baby diaper and could see individual strands of the molecules that are inside. When you add water, osmosis will draw the water in, and the baby diaper will swell. I think anybody who has a kid has done this experiment a lot of times, maybe more than you want to. So we start thinking, what if we could do this to a brain? What if we could weave these threads of baby diaper polymer around the building blocks, around the biomolecules that make up life? And if we do it just right, maybe we could pull apart the molecules. If we do it just right, maybe, like stars in a constellation in the sky, we can take a cell, like the one on the left here, and pull apart the building blocks until they look like something in the right, hovering in space, but with their relative organization preserved. So doing the opposite is often an interesting strategy, and we apply this all the time as a creativity skill that I would argue is a teachable, learnable thing. But it's only the beginning. One thing that we also do a lot of is we look at old, forgotten ideas. These polymers, they were, the physics was studied very heavily in the 1970s and 1980s. And furthermore, people figured out, believe it or not, how to synthesize these polymers inside of tissues in 1981. So we had to do a few extra steps in order to make this technology work. In this cartoon, you can see some of the building blocks of life, the biomolecules shown in brown. And we had to invent little anchors, little handles that we could attach to all of them so we could pull them apart, shown as little purple blobs in this cartoon. If we give every molecule a handle, it can pull them apart, maybe that could help us get down to this ground truth level of description that we crave. Then we have to weave these polymeric threads. And as I mentioned earlier, this was figured out in 1981 by two scientists in Germany. Basically, you soak the specimen that you want to, uh, to embed in a solution of these little building blocks called monomers, those are little white spheres, and they self-assemble into these long chains. And the chains then can connect to the biomolecules through the handle. So if you think about it, we have the baby diaper polymer, which can create force, and we have the handles, which can convey them. We're almost there. But there's one last thing we have to do. We have to soften everything up. The brain is very happy where it is. So we use heat and detergent and other things to soften up the molecules from each other. And then, then we add water, the baby diaper polymer swells, and this time the biomolecules come along for the ride. So here's a little time-lapse movie, an actual piece of brain that we're going to expand. We embedded it in the polymer earlier, and this is a time-lapse sped up about 50 times. And here we add the water right there. So I hope you can see this piece of brain is growing before your very eyes. I'm sure it's only a matter of time until some Hollywood scriptwriter makes a horror movie out of this. <laughs> and because those polymers are so tiny and so dense, we actually could get resolutions approaching that of individual biomolecules, which was our goal. We wanted to get to the ground truth, which meant seeing the entire system, but not losing sight of the building blocks. And so we published this a couple years ago, and already we've transferred the technology to hundreds and hundreds of research groups all over the world, and they're investigating all sorts of stuff with it. Parasites, and bacteria, and cancer, and all sorts of stuff. But what we were very excited about is the idea that now we can actually make images of the brain that are three-dimensional, that can extend throughout circuits, that don't lose sight of the wires. And so here's an example of a little piece of the brain involved with memory formation. You know, what if we could someday read out exactly how memory is stored in the architecture of the brain? I mentioned cancer earlier. We were approached by a bunch of doctors who said, look, cancer is um, uh, you know, very hard to detect when it's early. What if we could actually try to see those early changes and diagnose cancer long before it becomes a threat. So um, we worked with a couple of pathologists who work on breast cancer. It turns out that at the early stages of breast cancer, um, doctors will disagree up to half the time 
of the diagnosis, which is not good. And we showed that by expanding breast cancer specimens and using a committee's vote to train a machine learning algorithm, an AI if you will, we could actually do better diagnosis than machine learning could do without the expansion. So expansion is bringing these invisible features into the realm of the visible. So that's the first part of the story. Get down to the ground truth. It sounds challenging, but you can build a tool to get you there. The next story I want to talk about is about time. So the first story is about space. The second story I want to tell you about is about time. And the theme that I want to bring forth in this part of the talk is this concept of having every possible idea. You know, these are challenging problems. There's so many possibilities. How do you begin? And a strategy that we've actually found to be actually a useful exercise is to try to think of every possible way to solve a problem. Now that might sound paradoxical. It might actually sound even a bit futile. And I agree that it's not provably possible in all cases. But even a partial attempt to have all ideas can help. So the story I want to tell you about next is about how can we control the high-speed dynamics of the brain? How do we control the high-speed electrical pulses the brain cells generate? It can be very dangerous to pick just one path and stick with it. What if it's the wrong path? It's also dangerous sometimes to listen to experts. What if the experts haven't been thinking about the problem at the right level? As the old saying says, it goes, you know, if Henry Ford listened to what people wanted, he might have tried to breed faster horses. His customers didn't have the concept of the automobile in their head. So it's important to dig one level deeper, to get down to the ground truth, not when, just when you're trying to solve a problem, but when you're trying to pick the problem. I think that's one of the essences of 21st century scientific creativity. One way to prove it quickly is, um, you know, if you think about all the building blocks in a living system, or in e an economic system, or in education, or these other complex 21st century problems. There are thousands of building blocks. They interact in so many ways. The probability that any one is the most important is pretty small. You can end up making assumptions. Rather than a moonshot, you end up with a shot in the dark. Um, I sometimes call this the illusion of reductionism. We try to pretend the problem is simple, but it doesn't make it simple. So instead, can we consider sets of hypotheses as a group? rather than going after them one at a, at a time and maybe failing over and over and over. This way of thinking goes back to an astrophysicist named Fritz, Fritz Zwicky. Um, Fritz coined the term supernova. Um, he thought of how the uh, neutron stars formed. He hypothesized the origin of cosmic rays. He even predicted gravitational lenses um, in 1937. And now, in the last couple of years, gravitational waves have become a hot topic. In other words, he saw the future. He thought of many ideas in the 1920s and 30s and 40s that are the hot topics in astrophysics today, like dark matter. How did he do it? Well, he practiced a strategy that he called morphological analysis, but I call it the tiling tree method. Basically, you try to take a space of ideas and you split it into subsets that, like tiles on a bathroom floor, will cover the space of ideas so you don't lose any ideas. But ideally, you get you hone in to finer and finer ideas until they become testable, modelable hypotheses. Think of every possible way of generating an energy-producing system. OK, well, let's split it into two subcategories, renewable and non-renewable. So together, that pretty much tiles the space, right? We haven't lost any ideas so far. Ideas so far. But then you can make some interesting splits. Let's split renewable into solar and non-solar. And already we're starting to think of things that maybe are not obvious ways of generating power, because what's a non-solar renewable source? Maybe it's the moon dragging water to make the tides change. You know, maybe we go after um, geothermal energy, right? Strategies that are not usually at the top of most people's lists of how to generate energy. Non-renewable, we get split into fossil fuels and non-fossil fuels. So that gets interesting too. What's a non-renewable non-fossil fuel? Well, maybe we can think about um, nuclear energy, for example. Uh, that we remove from the ground. Um, and then you can split the tree in different ways, mind and not mind, right? So I love this exercise because it allows you to take a very complex space of problems and break it down into smaller subsets. So you don't really lose ideas by spl splitting them into parts, but you get closer and closer to actionable ideas. So in my own life, that's what we did to try to come up with a new way to stimulate the brain. My co-inventor, Carl Weisroth, and I, when we, we were both students in the year 2000, we decided to try to think of every possible way to stimulate the brain. 
And so we started making a long list of the forms of energy we could deliver. It could be sound, it could be mechanical, it could be optical, it could be radio. It turns out there's only so many kinds of energy that you can deliver to a brain. And then we started evaluating them. Um, and in the end, we picked optical because light, of course, is very fast and you could aim it at things. So imagine you could take little solar panels, install them in brain cells. As I told you earlier, brain cells compete using electricity. So if we put solar panels in there, shine light on them, we should be able to turn them on or off. And then the brain doesn't really feel pain, so you could bring optical fibers in the brain and turn on or off different parts of the brain. If you could do this, you could start to activate brain cells and figure out how they could initiate patterns of activity that might heal a disease state or turn off patterns of activity. What if you could shut down an epileptic seizure or a Parkinsonian tremor? Then the question became how to uh, make the cells light activated. And again, you can kind of split the space of ideas into two parts. You can make a molecule that converts light into electricity, or you could find a molecule. And so we started reading papers, and uh, we found papers that actually suggested that these molecules existed that could work in brain cells. And then the one that really got us going was a paper that studied algae. So algae, like the one in this cartoon, um, some of them have flagelli, these tails. And there's an eye spot, a little brown spot in the back, that receives light and converts light from the sun into signals that make those tails swim. They do this so the algae can swim to be near the surface of a pond, and so the chloroplast can receive light and photosynthesize better. <clears throat> now in this little eye spot in the algae, there are proteins. And these proteins, when they're hit with light, open up a little pore. And charged particles, or ions, will move from one side of the pore to the other. In other words, exactly what we want. Now, when you're building tools, there's always an element of luck. You can engineer serendipity, but you can't guarantee success. I'm not saying that these strategies are always guaranteed to work. And actually, when we get to the end of the talk, we'll end on this idea of failure being the key. So what did we find? Well, it turns out this protein is encoded by a little snippet of DNA. We could put this snippet of DNA into brain cells, and then we got really, really lucky. It turns out that you can manufacture in brain cells these very same molecules. And these molecules will be installed in the membrane, and they uh, wound up in the right spot. They didn't kill the brain cells. And they were fast enough and strong enough so when you shine light on the brain cells, they would actually respond and fire off electrical pulses, not unlike the ones in your brain right now as I'm saying these words. So that was just luck. But, you know, we optimized our luck. What can you do with this? Well, you can use all these tricks from the field of gene therapy, which I'm not going to go into, and you can put this snippet of DNA so that it'll turn on in cells of whatever kind you want. So, for example, there are cells in the brain that are known to generate interesting rhythms, um, brain waves, if you will. And uh, one of my collaborators actually took this molecule that we borrowed from algae and used a gene therapy vector to make little star-shaped cells in the brain sensitive to light. When you drive these cells with light, they have a resonance, like a bell ringing. They like to go to a certain frequency of around 40 times a second. This is kind of a magical number in neuroscience. So, you know, when you pay attention to something, your brain will have these oscillations that occur, for example, in some regions that occur at 40 times a second. So my collaborator, Li Wei Sai, went on to try to figure out if you could drive these patterns of brain activity and could they ever induce a healing state. And so Li Wei is an expert in Alzheimer's disease. And so she uh, used some mice that have been genetically engineered to have some of the mutations that in humans cause Alzheimer's. So they're not perfect models by a long shot, but you've got to start somewhere. And she found that if you drive the brains of these mice at 40 times a second through this trick, which we call optogenetics, opto for light, and genetic because we lucked out, it's a small gene that we can borrow from a little critter, then the brain's immune system turns on and you actually clean up a bunch of the different molecular hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, like the over-phosphorylated tau, or the amyloid plaques, or the inflammatory state of microglial cells. So that's interesting. A pattern of brain activity can actually cause the brain to go into a healthier state, and Alzheimer's to boot, one of the hardest to treat diseases of any kind. So with Emory Brown, an anesthesiologist and expert in brain waves, the teams went on to try to figure out, could you induce this pattern without the optogenetics? We don't want the optical fibers and the genes in our brain if we can get away with it. What if we could do it just by watching a movie or hearing something or seeing something? And so the teams went on and showed that when mice would actually watch a blinking light that blinked at this high speed, 
of 40 times a second, no genes, no optical fibers, no optogenetics, just a movie basically, then the immune system would turn on and the mice actually would get better. And so Li Wei and I recently co-founded a company, Cognito Therapeutics, which is now actually working on designing and testing in human trials movies to treat Alzheimer's. So once you have a foot in the door, you can cast the net more systematically. Once we knew that we could activate brain cells with light, we went on and examined how we could shut down neurons with light. We can search the entire tree of life for molecules that let us get control over different functions of cells and allow us to control different things in brain cells with light. And so now we have a whole suite of molecules that let us turn neurons on, let us turn neurons off, and so forth. Turning neurons off is particularly useful because you can delete cells momentarily. What if you could figure out the cells that when shut down would ameliorate a seizure or turn off a tremor? Or you know, some of my colleagues are trying to look at post-traumatic stress disorder. Could you help reverse a traumatic memory? So we found molecules from, that molecules from certain kinds of microbes you could put into brain cells and then shine light and turn off their electrical potentials. I'll just give you one of the many, many examples of what people have done with this. One of my collaborators, Akihiro Yamanaka, studies uh, narcolepsy, where people fall asleep at random and inopportune times. And in patients with narcolepsy, a tiny cluster of cells deep, deep in the brain actually atrophies. And so he asked the question, if you turn off these cells, is that enough to cause sleep? Or maybe when these cells are gone, other changes occur in the body, and that's what causes sleep. So he engineered mice to have these cells light silenceable, and he put an optical fiber into the brain connected to a laser. And here's what he found. This is the probability of being awake over time. And the orange bar is when the laser turned on. And so the mice start out mostly awake, and then the light turns on. And you can see, bam, within half a minute, they're all asleep. That's what you see down here. I'll use the mouse, I guess. And then when you turn the light off, they all wake back up. But you can see they're a little bit groggy, and they pass out again. So what we learned through this process is really this idea of having all possible ideas is a useful exercise. It's not guaranteed to work. But it can help you think of things that you might not ordinarily have thought of. And it provides a structure for thinking that can really help uh, uh, make more creative applications come to mind when you're dealing with something of almost infinite apparent complexity. So we started with ground truth. We went on to all possible ideas. And I want to end on the note of failure. Because failure is really at the heart of everything we do. Um, we try things out, and most of the time it's going to fail. Um, but I like to argue for constructive failures. In other words, we're going to try something that's going to fail, but we'll see something that nobody's seen before, and that'll tell us what to do next. <laughs> I like this way of framing things because we're not just failing fast, you know, we're learning from the process. We're not just continuing blindly on either. We will um, celebrate failure, but not in a, a way that feels false. We don't want to celebrate failure in a way that seems artificial. We want to celebrate failure in a way that really points to the future. And so the strategies that I've been talking about today all had a long history between the idea, which would often happen several years before we actually got something to work. And sometimes the failure was a failure of recognition. We'd have the idea, but maybe not realize how important it was until some time later. Um, we brainstormed up the idea for the optogenetic control uh, in the year 2000, but we didn't bother with the first experiments until four years later, because it took us time to realize how important this was. The idea for expansion of the brain we thought up uh, probably around 2007 in our group, but it took up five years until, again, we realized this is actually a really good idea. So one thing that I do a lot of is also to try to learn from other people's failures, to talk to people and understand what has uh, hit a brick wall. And uh, we can sometimes reboot the failures into successes. If a failure is not due to a fundamental problem, maybe it can be rebooted because now we have faster computers or we have you know, mobile telecommunications or better genome sequencing or who knows what. And that makes a past failure into a current success. As I mentioned earlier, I really like to study the history of science to learn about its future. And if you look at some of the most important discoveries of our time, they also had a history of failure rebooting. And I think this is not an uncommon observation. You know, Google wasn't the first search engine. Facebook wasn't the first uh, social network. Um, very often, people came close, but they were missing a certain thing. And by rebooting a failure with a slight plot twist, you could actually make it successful. Let's talk about PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, maybe the most famous reaction in all biology. This is how you detect DNA at a crime scene, right? 
Carrie Mullis had the idea in 1985, kicks off a whole industry, wins a Nobel Prize for it. But the actual outline of how to do PCR was sketched out in a paper by some MIT scientists in 1971, a full 14 years earlier. What changed? Why was it not recognized? Um, you could argue that there's a, if we were to more deliberately try to reboot failures, maybe we would be able to accelerate progress. Maybe one of the most famous examples of our time is machine learning. A lot of the mathematics for machine learning and AI was worked out in the 1980s and 1990s, or even earlier. And now in the last few years, algorithms based on these mathematics and extensions of them have been getting headlines for learning how to beat people in chess and in Go. Um, what's different now? Well, we have a lot of data. We have a lot of compute power. Back in the 80s and 90s, those two things were not there. So a good strategy is to really track failures, both yourselves and others, and look for opportunities to reboot them when the world is a different place. So one of my jobs really is to be chief failure tracker in my group and to figure out when something that seemed like an okay idea or a bad idea might be time to make reality. My personal dream is that we can not only continue to innovate ways to innovate, like these ground truthing ideas, like the all possible idea strategies, and like the structuring of projects with constructive failures, but to make tools that are very practical and that tell us how the brain works. So I've told you a few short stories about how we actually are building these tools. My dream is we can bring in the next decade these tools together. What if we could watch a brain in action and then map it out and in a computer make a model of the brain so we can understand what a decision really is, what a feeling really is? Would it help us understand something about what it means to be human, what it means to have thoughts and feelings, maybe even become more enlightened and understand something about the nature of suffering and happiness? So for me, the long-term goal is really to start to merge science and philosophy. Can we understand something about you know, why we are here and, and what we should do in life? But along the way, I'm very happy that we've been able to come up with lots of practical strategies that might actually help with different arenas like Alzheimer's and cancer and so forth. And so that's maybe the closing note that I wanted to end on. You know, This is a, a long path we want to take or a tall mountain we want to climb, pick your favorite metaphor. But along the way, we should try to reflect upon what we've done and understand when something is of general importance um, and to teach it and make it available to others. So thank you very much, and I can take questions. This, of course, is the most important slide. This is a very large team with literally 100 collaborating groups around the world. And um, in a short talk like this, we can't acknowledge every individual um, but I want to end by acknowledging how omnidisciplinary this effort is and how many people led the different projects. We're going to open it up to the questions, and uh, we'll repeat them so that we can catch them on the video, okay? Yeah, well, that's why, why I wanted to end on the note of philosophy. You know, where are we going and why is important. And if we're just changing for change's sake in some random direction, you know, it's very important, very possible that one could be efficiently going in a direction you don't want to be going in. And so for me, what got me interested in the brain in the first place was this idea that maybe we could understand something about suffering and happiness. And curing people is, of course, a great goal. But to me, it's almost like a byproduct of the long-term goal of understanding the human condition. That said, I do want to figure out how you know, we're in an era now where you know, uh, Elon Musk is launching Neuralink, and Brian Johnson is launching Kernel, and you know, we're seeing you know, Apple's hiring neuroengineers. We're seeing neurotechnology become a thing. And so one of the things that I've been working to figure out now is whether we could launch you know, what might be the first global neuroethics conference where we want to bring together companies and you know, large and small, and governments, and religious leaders, and lawyers, and lots of people, doctors, of course, and to really figure out you know, what do we want to do. So 1975, that's what 
the field of molecular biology did for gene cloning. And in the half century since, you know, there's been huge numbers of therapies for cancer and you know, hemophilia and all sorts of stuff. And the number of disasters has been very, very small, you know, nearly zero, frankly. And so I think that's a suggestion that maybe we should get out ahead of the problem. Let's figure out how to, let's talk about it. Let's figure out how to self-govern. How do we decide what we want to do, what we don't want to do, or what do we want to do, but let's figure out how to do it better. And I think that we can, you know, again, I think one of the themes of what I've been trying to talk about today is how do we do on purpose what previous generations did accidentally? We saw what worked. Can we make it more deliberate now? Yes? I think um, kind of building on that, there have been, like, in a lot of the discoveries that we have made, there's been a lot of pushback, like in genetically modified organisms, for example. People are very uncomfortable with that. So have you seen if you expect any pushback on these ideas as well? Well, so the way that we're approaching uh, the problem is to think of how to heal the sick. So can we build therapies to help people with different conditions? And the reason I think that's a good way to start is because you have to think about how risk and reward are balanced. Where I get uncomfortable is when people are pushing to augment the brain and we don't fully understand the consequences of that. So for example, there are people doing do-it-yourself brain stimulation. We don't know that the long-term effects of brain stimulation in humans because all the studies are fairly short-term. So I would hate to think that somebody would be stealing their brain maybe over a fairly trivial quest like becoming better at a video, ga video game or something and you know, what happens 30 years later. What I do think can emerge um, you know, through talking, but also if you again look at the history of medicine, is that sometimes uh, if a therapy comes out and it, you, it's helping people with very severe illness, but it is shown to be safe and effective, maybe it can broaden in utility. And we've seen cases where it has happened. We've also seen cases where people find out a therapy is no good and they kill it off. So um, I do think there might be a natural time scale over which medical ethics in 2018 would allow augmentation to occur. But does it make sense to, to try to break the risk reward curve in an unnatural way, in a way that might violate ethics? I don't think so. Okay. Yes? I really love the idea of uh, constructive failures. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could share with us one of your personal favorites. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, two of, the, two of them that I mentioned, I think, uh, really stick out in my mind. The idea that between the idea for optogenetic control of neurons and the idea of expansion, and actually bothering to give it a try. It was about a four to five year period. I think this is sort of a failure of wisdom. I'll get an example for the expansion microscopy. So um, a postdoc, Ryan Chow and I, were brainstorming up this idea of expanding brains, but this is one year after a bunch of people were all working on nanoscale resolution microscopes. So I was thinking, yeah, they'll figure it out. So flash forward to the point where Faye Chen and Paul Tilburg, my two grad students who were the first authors of the paper were in the group, and Faye was trying storm microscopy, and Paul was trying electron microscopy. And a year in, it was looking like, wow, it's gonna take forever to map a 3D brain circuit. So, you know, uh, one way to look at it is maybe, you know, we had the knowledge in the year 2007, but we didn't have the wisdom until Faye and Paul actually wrestled with the problem and went through a constructive failure. And so we then abandoned the electron microscopy work and we abandoned the super resolution microscopy work. But that wisdom then helped us go into the next stage, which turned out to be a big hit.